This is graph walking in Postgres for fun and possible profit. Uh, that's what we call foreshadowing. Uh, it's the story of how I built a system to sift and correlate a large volume of data using Postgres at the center of everything. Uh, about me, who I am, I'm, as I said, Mark Breicher. You'll find me as Maker17 on various places. Uh, my degree is in theoretical math, but the only thing I've, anyone has ever wanted to pay me to do is play with computers, and so that's what I do. I'm a software engineer and data nerd at a succession of startups in the area, and this is the story of uh, how we built a system at one of them. So how we got here. Uh, I was at a startup about 10 years ago, and our existing business was data discovery and analytics for small and medium-sized companies who couldn't or wouldn't do it for themselves. Uh, think corner bakery, a coffee shop, a contractor. Uh, we would find, we would crawl the web and we would find data about the business and identify things that were wrong and help them fix it. And we would also crawl reviews from everywhere and do some analysis on them. Like things like the food was good, the ambiance was nice, but the waiter was rude. Deal with that. Um, anyways, that was our existing business. But what our customers told us over and over again is what they really wanted to know is who their customers were. Uh, these are small, medium-sized businesses again, mom and pop shops. Um, CRM is not in their <laughs> wheelhouse, even if they had the time to try. try. Um, at best, uh, think, of that, think of the contractor we we're talking about. They come back from a day in the field and they've got a stack of voicemail. And all they know is the number. What they really want to know is whether you own your home or apartment or condo or whatever. If you own, then you can authorize them to do work and they want to talk to you. If you don't, then to get work done, they have to deal with your landlord, which they don't want to do. They don't even want to return your phone call, if we're being completely honest. Um, but they don't know that. All they know is the phone number. Or in the case of, say, the bakery or the coffee shop, there might be a clipboard on the counter where you could put your name and your phone number and your email address if you wanted them to send you a coupon. But that's pretty much the extent of what these people have. Uh, so we set out to build a system to profile individuals based upon the small bits of data that our client businesses actually did have. The, name, uh, the phone number, the email address, whatever, whatever they had, we would, we would try. Uh, one of the founders hacked together a proof of concept, and he used that to drum up some interest and some money. And I was tasked with commercializing the idea and running it at scale. And after trying a few different things that were false starts, we decided we were going to treat the problem as a graph problem. You cut, cut a problem up into small pieces and solve it that way. Uh, in this case, each node in the graph is going to be a piece of data, a phone number, a physical address, an email address, a name, uh, a Twitter handle, how much money you make in a year, whether you own that home. Uh, the edges are going to be nodes that we think, for whatever reason, are related. Uh, in this case, the probability that we think that they are related to each other. How, how sure are we that this name and this phone number go together? Uh, and what we're looking for is a graph, what we came to call a graph neighborhood, the enumeration of all nodes that are reachable from a starting point by a path that doesn't exceed some threshold in its weight. Uh, built a test data set of about 10 million nodes and 50 million edges and started trying it on every system I could on you know, my, my work laptop, which was not a slouch. Um, we're looking at much bigger than this eventually, but to test 10 million nodes, 50 million edges. And every graph system I tried would OOM. Uh, they're really good at path optimization. From node A to node B, find me the optimum path given weights on the edges, but this path enumeration problem, they are not good at, or weren't good at, again, 10 years ago. Maybe they've gotten better. Uh, at the time, not something they were tuned to do. Uh, the test bed had about 32 gigs of RAM, and they would just blow through it, trying to, I think, prematurely read too much of the graph into memory, uh, and not enough pruning on poor paths. In any case, not good. Uh, 
after weeks, maybe a month, of trying various graph systems, my boss, the VP, comes by my desk and quietly asks, is this thing actually going to work? Like, do we keep funneling money into this? And I said, yes, I think it, I mean, my gut tells me it's going to work, but my gut also tells me that these dedicated graph engines are not the path forward. And I started trying to play around in Postgres because, one, I like Postgres, and two, if you squint hard enough, every problem is a database problem, and this one fits. A pretty simple schema, um, kind of what you would expect. You've got nodes, you've got edges with foreign keys back to the nodes. Our nodes have types so that we know which nodes are email addresses and which nodes are uh, physical addresses and which nodes are what college you went to. Uh, and we also have the documentation behind all this. We have the sources where we find data, and then for, e for a given source, we have an edge source that tells us specifically in that data set or that website or that API, what was the call or what was the key that gave us information to suggest that this name and this phone number or this name and this email address or any two nodes go together. Um, that documentation is all stored in the edge sources and the sources. So, um, now's a good time to point out that all the SQL, DDL and DML you're going to see today, it is functional, but it is not precisely what was in the system we built, that I built, because primarily I haven't, access, haven't had access to that Git repo in years. Uh, and, well, that's, that's really the big one. Uh, <laughs> functionally, it works. I've actually got it running on my laptop. Uh, if we have time at the end, I'll... I'll, I'll play on the screen. We'll see. Uh, anyways, types, pretty simple. An ID and a name. The nodes, uh, we've got the type. Referencing back to the type there. We store a normalized version and a pretty version. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. And then we've got a unique index on the, normal, on the, unique index on the text of the normalized version. Um, and then we also have a gen index on the normalized so we can find things. Uh, Yes. Uh, I think that's enough for there. Looking at the edges, the edge is pretty much what we'd expect. You've got an ID, you've got the node that's coming from, the node that's going to, the probability that we think these two are connected. Uh, you know, the probability is bigger than zero and less than one. Uh, if it's zero, we don't care. There's really no reason to create an edge. And we live in an uncertain world, so nothing is going to get 100% probability of connection. Everything is going to be some somewhere up to that. Uh, unique index on the from and the to, so we can't duplicate edges. And then an index on the from and then descending on the probability. So it's easy to find edges out from some node that stay above some probability threshold. And we do some adjustments on the probability. Uh, if you're given a phone number, say 213-555-1234, it's pretty clear that the name for that is going to be John Smith. If you're trying to build a profile for some John Smith somewhere, the probability that any one of these phone numbers is the one that you're looking for, that is his phone number, vanishingly small. So what we do is we take the base probability for the relationship and we start to weight it down based upon the cardinality out from, say, this name node to nodes of the same type. If you've got 20 phone numbers attached to the same name, they all get weighted down so that we don't walk out to any one of them trying to build a profile. So you can walk really easily from the phone to the name, not so easily from the name to the phone. And this is just the sources and the edge sources. Again, pretty much what you'd expect. Um, the source has a base probability um, and a name and some URI that identifies it. The base probability for most sources was very low in the 25 to 30% range. And the idea here is that a lot of, until we've done some research on a source of data, we assume it's crap. And we give it a low probability to store the relationship. And then if we decide after looking at it that it's better, then we start boosting things up. We also will take reinforcing evidence from multiple sources and start boosting edge probabilities up. So if five sites tell us that John Smith's phone number is the 1234 number, then that edge gets boosted up because 
five independent sources telling you something is well, better than one. Even if they're all generally bad sources, if they all agree on something, we hope it's true. Uh, and then the edge source gets the probability from the source it's coming from and a URI that identifies in that source where specifically we found it, what page we found it on, what key into a data set, what uh, key in a request to an API, whatever it is, that's where that gets stored. And again, source is unique for the edge and the source, just, you know, we don't want to duplicate data. And we're in a database, so we can do things like that. Yes, ma'am. Um, some of the people I worked with at the time were big fans of surrogate keys. There, oh yes, she was asking why the surrogate key if we have a unique key on the edge and the source. And the answer really is some of the people I worked with at the time were fanatical about surrogate keys. And so, so here we are. Uh, yes. Local standards is, I guess, the, uh, the answer to that question. Uh, taking a look at a node specifically, um, for any given data type, we started looking at how we could chop it up to represent it in JSON. We're storing the JSON, JSON as the payload in the node. And then we would normalize it to try to, um, well, to make it unique within the set and easy to find. Uh, taking, this is Pasadena Convention Center, 300 East Green Street, Pasadena, California, 91101. We got the pretty version here, and we got the normalized version here. For addresses specifically, we took the normalized address structure from PostGIS because we were already using it for other things. Uh, we added the plus four because we wanted it. I think they have that now, but at the time they didn't. And we added latitude and longitude. I had this unrealized dream that we we're gonna do lots of things with latitude and longitude, but really it just got used to put points on a map. Um, You'll note the normalize is generally uppercased and abbreviated, and all the fluff has been wrung out of it. Um, but yeah, so this is unique within the graph, and then the pretty is what we're going to return at the end. Uh, the end result, the goal here, is to, given, say, a phone number, to return a JSON document with all the information we could find to profile that individual. and then the node stores some piece, some, some uh, fragment of that JSON document, for instance, an address. And at the end, we're gonna take all the nodes that form the neighborhood around our starting point, we're gonna merge all the JSON together and return stash that document, and that's, that's the end hope here, is to return a JSON document as, as the result of an API call. And so here we have the, result, the resulting document, or well, the query that generates the resulting document. It's a recursive CTE, a common table expression, which is where SQL says with, and then a name, possibly some structure, as this. I've highlighted the bits that are key here. One, this is a recursive query. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Well, actually, we'll talk about it now. Recursive in, recursive in Postgres, you have to declare it recursive. And then you have the two sides of a union. On the top here, we're finding our starting point. In this case, 626-555-1234 is a phone number. We're doing JSON containment to find that. And then your union with a join back to itself. Uh, in this case, uh, we're querying to find edges out from nodes that are already in the neighborhood to other nodes where the probability of the edge keeps us above 0 0.45, 45%. Uh, other things to note, we're keeping an array of the IDs we've seen as we work our way through the graph. Uh, we use this down here to avoid any, creating any cycles. Um, you don't want to loop back to yourself. And then at the end, once we've recursed through and we found all the nodes we're going to find above 45% on a path, we take the node ID, the pretty version, and then the maximum probability we saw for a path to that node from our starting point. Uh, there's likely multiple paths in here uh, for a given node, and we're just interested in what's the best one we found. Um, 
I played around a lot with trying to do better early pruning than this, and everything I did was clunky, and this got the job done. So some duplication, and then we do some grouping at the end to sort of ring the duplication out and give us the unique set of nodes. And that's really it, um, or most of it. Oh, other things to note, sorry, let's see. We're dealing just with, well, we have our node starting point, but after that, it's just the edges and then the neighborhood CT, which is, which is, in, which is in memory, we, well, unless it flushes to disk. But anyways, we'll say it's in memory. Uh, so we, haven't, we don't need to deal with the node data specifically at all. Uh, which is good. It's, a, it's, it's about as tight as we can get it. So the hardware this thing ran on. Uh, my father once told me that a one sign of a good job is that they buy you nice, shiny toys to play with. Um, and by that metric, this job didn't disappoint. Uh, when they asked me what I was going to need for hardware, I said something along the lines of as much RAM as you can cram into a box, a lot of CPU, and a whole lot of storage. And some of that is going to have to be on SSDs. And I didn't think I was going to get it all. But what ended up getting delivered on a pallet was two servers, each with 512 gigabytes of RAM, uh, which led to some uncomfortably large settings for WorkMem, but good uncomfortable large settings for WorkMem. Uh, 28 Xeon cores, several terabytes of SSD, and about four times that in spinny disks. Uh, we formatted everything in ZFS. We put the indexes and all the small table data on the SSDs, and then the big tables, nodes, edges, edge sources, had their data on the spinny disks, but their indexes, again, were on the SSDs. Uh, we use ZFS primarily because we're used to it from our existing database servers, and we're comfortable with it, and we kind of built our backup strategy around that. We would do pro uh, physical replication to uh, the hot standby, and it, we would quiesce that periodically, take a ZFS snapshot and then ship that off site where we would apply it to a, another smaller server just to make sure that we actually got a nice working server out of the result uh, because it's not really relevant specifically this but always test your backups if you can't get a good working server out of it it's not really good anyways uh, a nice beefy box two nice beefy boxes and nice shiny toys and that's the MVP um, at this point, we're working just with my synthetic data set, 10 million nodes, 50 million edges, and it mostly works. Uh, we get rid of the synthetic data and we start soliciting real data from our clients, uh, which usually goes something like this. We get a request. Uh, at the beginning, that's you know, the data from that clipboard, or uh, later on, it's integrations into things like phone systems, email systems, watching their Facebook profile to see if people DM them or talk to them, Twitter, whatever. Any, any connection, any communication from an individual to the company, we try to grab onto it and build a profile based upon it. So a request comes in. It goes into an initial discovery, which first looks at some local data sets. Uh, we had primarily two. We had one that was every residential phone number in the United States uh, and the name and physical address for it and some demographic information. And another local data set was every cell phone in the United States, and again, name and some information attached to it. Uh, we hit those first because we have them stored locally and it's quick and easy. And there's a couple APIs we reach out to, and all that is sort of our initial first pass at what can we get quickly uh, to, for the data we've been given. We throw all that into a crawling queue, and we also throw it into a document queue down here to go into the graph. The graph populator takes that document, which is actually in the format of our result, the JSON document result we want in the end, chunks it into pieces and starts creating nodes or finding nodes that they already exist, adding or boosting edges, um, doing all that probability leveling we were talking about before, uh, and throwing the data into the graph. The crawler comes over here to the web crawler and that's just going out into the web and finding everything it can based upon the information that fell out of initial discovery. So maybe we started with a phone number and we were able to get a, a name and a physical address. So now we've got a little bit more to latch onto as we search the web for data. Um, and all that 
ultimately goes into the document queue again, gets chunked into pieces, and, and flows into the graph. And so we start shoveling data in pretty much as fast as we can. And about the time we hit 500 million nodes, the sharp edges start to show. So at this point, we're, what, 50 times the size of the initial data set we were testing with? And it's real data. And real data has fun, real problems with it. Uh, quickly, the problems that showed up, and I'll go into each of these in detail shortly, but uh, that worker that maintains the graph, that takes the document data, chunks it up, and starts to manipulate the graph to, to, to put it in, he started to slow way down. And well, we ultimately figured out why. Uh, there were some sporadic reports of cross-profile contamination. You're building, a, you're building a profile for George, and you get some data about Sally as well, which is not ideal. Um, and then someone came along and said that they wanted to change some of those data normalization rules that uh, govern how we, how we represent the data in the graph. So the graph maintenance performance, it all came back to, it's easier to point out if I do there. It all came back to this, which is the query to figure out how many phone numbers we already have for John if we're adding another one. If we have a thousand known phone numbers for John and we're adding a thousand and one, the thousand and first, the query to figure out how many of them are there uh, for big queries turned out to be very expensive. Um, and it's all about joining the edges to the nodes and looking for nodes of a particular type and doing a count. In most cases, it was fine, but for large cardinality sets, it was not fine. Um, we gave this, we tried boosting the work mem for the, for the worker and it helped but not enough. And so ultimately what I ended up doing to fix this was I created a function that I called node to type that just goes out to the nodes table and grabs the type. And if we lie and say that it's immutable, and we'll come back to that in a second, uh, then we can create an index on the from node type, from node ID, and then the type of the to node, the node that we're, that we're walking the, the edge to. And the point here now is that I can quickly, with an index scan, get the count of edges out to phone nodes from wherever I'm at, um, rather than joining to nodes and, and going through the rigmarole and, and the large set. It's just a partial index scan. Uh, you do have to tell Postgres that it's immutable because you can't build an index on it if it can change, um, which is smart. I mean, it's good. <coughs> it's just that in this case, um, well, Let's just say it's immutable by fiat. I say it's immutable. I say that if you change the type of a node, I'll be very unhappy with you. And then I don't give anyone access to do it. Uh, but it technically could, you technically could go in as a Postgres user and change the type of a node. But realistically, if a node is created as a phone number, it will always be a phone number. Um, or it might fall out of use entirely, but it's never gonna turn into a Twitter handle. Uh, it will always be the thing it was created at. So we can safely, tell the little white lie that it's immutable and build the index, and all of a sudden our performance problem goes away. It's, it's almost like magic. Uh, I'll take your word for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and again, this is me creating this after the fact. Uh, trying to get something to work now. Um, I couldn't tell you precisely what the function looked like at the time. I do know this works. Fair enough. All right. Cross-contaminated profiles. Originally, this looked self-inflicted. And I just said, ah, it's the salespeople they can fix it. Um, what happened was, or what brought it to light was, the salespeople would load their own data into the graph, so then they went out to a client site, they could run a profile on themselves, and look, how, look at this wonderfully detailed profile we have. And they, did, they loaded up all the data they could think of about themselves with insanely high probabilities, like 99.9999999999%. And they included everything they could think of, including income data. They had their salaries at a highly detailed level, like pennies for the year. Um, 
And it turned out that two of the salespeople made exactly the same amount in a year, to the penny. And so, it was very easy to walk into that shared node. You have to understand that most of the income nodes in the graph were like, oh, to the thousands or ten thousands of dollars, right? We're looking for buckets to, to, to place people in for how much they make, not that they make, you know, $100,593.17 for the year. So, it's very easy to walk into that shared income node, back out to data about the other salesperson, and merge the two profiles. So, uh, so like I said, initially looked self-inflicted, but it did turn up a larger issue, which is to say, nodes that have edges out to a low cardinality set of nodes, but still more than one. A uh, great example of this would be me. My name, as I said at the beginning, is Mark Bracher. There are, as far as I know, two of us in the United States. There's me, and there's a professor in Ohio. And that's really it. So if you're building a profile on me, or from my phone number, it's very easy to walk into the Mark Bracher name node, and then walk back out and start pulling in data about the professor. Um, assuming all the edges are high enough probability, that's not that hard a thing to do. So, okay, so it started out as self-inflicted, but now it looks more real. Um, so we, it's a legitimate problem. We end up solving it by giving types a, an identifying attribute, which is to say, is this type of data identifying of an individual or not? And we're gonna say that things like emails, phone numbers, Facebook handles, Twitter handles, physical addresses, these are identifying-ish. Um, which is to say, given one of them, we're identifying a person, or maybe a household, but in the case of a physical address, but everything else, how much money you make, what your name is, uh, what college you went to, uh, these things are not identifying. And then we're going to modify that recursive query so we'll only walk out from nodes that are identifying. You can walk into any type of node and pull it into the, into the set, but to walk out, the source has to be an identifying node. And that query then looks like this. Uh, I've highlighted the changes. We're picking up the type ID as we start, and we're picking up the type of our two node as we progress our way through the graph, because we already have that in the index. And then we're restricting ourselves to type IDs that are in the set of identifying types on the types table. And that's enough. That keeps us from walking. Yes? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, positional. We're grouping by the first and second column. And then our aggregate is the third. Um, so, these changes are enough to keep the graph walker from, well, walking into shared non-identifying nodes and polluting the resulting, uh, sorry, re polluting the resulting uh, document, profile, profile, polluting the resulting profile. And then, finally, remember, somebody wanted to change some of the normalization rules. This one is tricky because we use the normalized version to enforce uniqueness in the graph. And we've now got about a half a million nodes. Not a half a million, 500 million nodes, a half a billion nodes. And there's, either, there's one of two possibilities. You're either going to make the normalization more restrictive, and now two nodes that are currently unique might no longer be unique and they're gonna collide in the graph. Or you're going to make the normalization uh, more permissive and data that currently has collapsed into more than one node is suddenly going to be uh, data from multiple sources that collapse into a single node is maybe representative of multiple. Either way, it's almost, I couldn't find a way to do it that wasn't going to be a stop the world event. Uh, I either have to dump out, or I pretty much, I have to dump out everything of a type, renormalize them and load them back up again. And if I try to do that while the plane is flying, um, well, I won't be able to find any of those nodes to start a crawl, and I won't be able to walk into or out of them. Um, it's just a bad idea. Uh, so I talked them out of it. Uh, yes? 
This one. Uh, I don't think so. If I'm being honest, I think the original version of this, the walker queried the set of node types that were identifying as it started up and just spliced them statically into the query. Uh, but this is easier to actually figure out what's going on instead of just saying like 1, 3, 7, and 12. Um, I, I actually haven't profiled it with the, the in versus the join. Um, yeah. On my laptop at the moment, there's a very limited set of data, so everything is really fast. Uh, in this case, I, probably, I would have profiled it um, on real data, but again, yeah. So as I said, um, I just I ended up talking them out of it loudly and at length. There may have been some threats, um, but the problem went away. Uh, they decided they didn't really need to change the normalization rules. And so it works. And it keeps on going. It keeps on growing. Um, at peak, it had about a one and a half billion nodes with about 8 billion edges and 20 billion sources for those 8 billion edges um, and thousands of sources in, in, in below that we're pulling data from, correlating, sifting to produce profiles. Um, yeah. OK, it works. But should I build the thing in the first place? Um, this, yes. Same hardware. Now, a couple of things here. Uh, ZFS compression helps us because we're able to trade a little bit of CPU, which we have a lot of for decrease in I.O. Um, and in storage. Uh, but yeah, the same, the same server that we started running it on, it, it grew to this size. Once it was moving smoothly, uh, I started spending most of my time trying to think about what we were going to do when we couldn't fit it all on one server um, because, well, <laughs> because I don't like having a ceiling on my growth. Uh, the hiccup there would, was really going to be once you shard the data, say into Citus or something similar, um, that recursive CT is no longer an option. You're going to have to do more work client side and have data going back and forth, and things are going to slow way down. Um, but that was actually the focus of my work once things were moving smoothly. Um, but And this is the foreshadowing from earlier. About this time, the company ran out of money and closed the doors. So um, it stopped being a problem I had to worry about. I had other problems to worry about, like I built this system to take everyone's private information, well, public information, but identifying information, and sift it and correlate it together and build these nice detailed profiles, and I no longer have control over it. Uh, we are talking at, at the core about harvesting, mass harvesting of personally identifiable information and pulling it together to profile people. Uh, GDPR was not yet a thing, and we weren't in the EU but still, uh, CCPA wasn't, definitely wasn't a thing yet. Although I would say to try to do this today would be a very different story. Uh, mass harvesting a PI and storing it, problematic. Uh, because of the way we're representing the data, removal requests get problematic as well. Um, so I wouldn't want to try this today, if we're being <laughs> honest. Uh, but my big problem when they shut the doors and laid everybody off was what's going to happen to this? What's going to happen to this tech, right? Like, I built this thing and it works and it works really well, and now somebody's going to be able to use it for whatever. Um, thankfully, there's a bit of a silver lining there. Uh, some of the IP, the founder managed to hold on to the IP and eventually rolled it into a company to help individuals find and deal with their PII that's scattered around the internet. So that's the silver lining here, um, the moderate happy ending. Uh, but still, yeah. Uh, I was, while I was working on it, I was myopically focused on the, the technical challenge. I've got a problem to solve. I've got, you know, I can do this. I'm smart enough, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and it was only when things started to fall apart that I started thinking about the longer reaching philosophical uh, discussions. Anyways, wow, I must be, 
I guess the caffeine is having its effect. I got through that in about 30 minutes instead of uh, 30, 35 minutes, instead of like the 40, 45 I was counting on. So this is where we take questions. Uh, the SQL, all the SQL from the slides is in Git at that address. QR code will take you there. Um, an older version of the slides is in Git. And this version of the slides will be in Git once I get a chance to export it and, and, and push it up there. Uh, but all the data is there for your, for your interest. Anyways, questions, comments, anything? Yes? As with many things in life, it depends. <clears throat> it really depends on how big that graph neighborhood ends up being around a given node. Uh, generally sub-second. Yeah. Yes? Generally, there were some profiles that went out to like 10, 15, 20 steps on the graph. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's not, even then it's not so much the depth as how much data you're pulling together at each step that you're then joining back out from the next one. Okay. I mean, generally, I mean, we didn't hit any diabolical edge cases, so I didn't dig deeply into how much it was recursing. Um, yeah. No, no. Um, the performance problems were all on the graph construction side. The query in the graph generally just worked once it worked. Yes, sir. Uh, the probability is calculated and maintained separately, and then the recursive CTE is compounding the probability of the edges as it walks through. Um, so here we go. The new probability is the probability of the path thus far in the neighborhood times the probability of the edge we're about to walk out. Um, and then we're restricting such that the probability of the edge we're about to walk will keep us above 0.45 on the aggregate path probability. So we don't consider nodes that would take us below our threshold. We don't consider paths Sorry. We don't consider adding edges to nodes that would take the path below our threshold. Does that? Uh, the first time we add an edge. So the first time we add an edge between two nodes, it's the base probability from its source. As we add more reinforcing evidence to that edge, then we're boosting it. Um, based upon the probability it had and the probability of the source we're boosting it from. And then we're doing some of the, the weighting down uh, based upon the cardinality out to edges of the same, uh, to nodes of the same type. So there's kind of a, a balancing going on there. Boost it as we find reinforcing evidence, weight it down as the cardinality goes up for a type, and things kind of settle out. So that it's easy to, again, it's easy to walk from, say, a, a phone number to a name, not so easy from a name to a phone number. That sort of thing is happening as we, as we load up edges as, and we load up nodes. And then also the, the reinforcing, the, boost, the boosting reinforcing probability happens again as we're adding an edge. So if we came along and we said, oh, the edge already exists, then we would say, oh, it's, it exists at 40%. Uh, so we're going to boost it based upon this new source that we just found. Does that help? OK. Yes, sir.
No, I mean, it's more limiting, <laughs> it's limiting the, the, it actually improves things because it's limiting the paths that the, the, the graph walker is willing to consider. He's not willing to walk out from anything he isn't identifying, so there's fewer possibilities. Um, I was afraid that the profiles were going to get leaner and less, you know, full featured, and, um, but I was willing to accept that so long as, like, the profile didn't merge five people together. I mean, a lean profile that is accurate is better than a nice, full-fledged, full-featured profile that is worthless, <laughs> I guess, if that, yeah. There we go. Anyone? All right, well, this has been graph walking for fun and it turns out no profit, but uh, I had hopes, anyways. Thank you. <laughs>